All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our first Ed Puzzle lecture uh, in AP World History. My name is Mr. Cernak, um, and I welcome you to the AP World History class here at Rancho High School. We're actually just going to go ahead and dive right in because I do want to ensure that I get through these videos in a fairly timely manner, um, so that way you guys can get to work on your other classes as well. Generally speaking, these videos, I'm going to try to keep them anywhere from 30 to about 50 minutes. I might go a little short on some, a little long on others, depending on the uh, content that uh, is necessary for me to go over. Um, this particular video will be a little bit longer because I'm introducing some of the major themes and topics that will go throughout the entire year. So please be patient. Please work with me on this one and know that in the future, I'm going to narrow down these videos and uh, condense them as much as possible because I certainly do not want to waste any of your time. Our um, topic for this lecture is developments in East Asia. We're really going to be focusing on China today. That's the part of the world that we're going to, to be looking at. Now, what I need need to do as a teacher, which is a, a little bit difficult here, is I need to go over all of the, all of the things before 1200. AP World History starts at the year 1200, but that doesn't mean that, you know, people just existed in the year 1200 and had never existed before that. No, there were things that were happening well before the year 1200, and I need to talk about some of those things. So I will be reaching back to the past, uh, looking at things that happened well before the year 1200, and then tying them into the time period that we're looking at, which is 1200 to 1450, and then also tying some of that into our modern society, as you'll see in this lecture. Now, our first unit is unit one, obviously, it makes sense to start with, um, and it's called the global tapestry. What I'm going to be doing in this unit is laying out the major characters, who are the major nations, major societies we're going to be looking at. So today it will be China. In um, subsequent lectures, we'll be looking at India, we'll be looking at Southeast Asia, we'll be looking at West and East Africa, we'll be looking at Europe, and we'll be looking at the Americas, and then we will also look at the Middle East, what we're going to call Dar al-Islam, or the, the Muslim world there. I'm also going to be laying out the major themes, and I'll talk about that on a different slide because I have it presented uh, there for you. Let's go ahead and get started. During all of these videos, as you'll see in the Ed Puzzle, you'll be expected to answer questions, and you'll do that on your computer screen. Don't go ahead and type out your answer, and that will be very obvious and very straightforward. I think you guys should be able to figure that out. But you also need to be taking notes. You are expected to watch these videos before class and have your notes with you when you come to our, our synchronous learning sessions. Uh, so that way you can use them in order to answer the questions and do the writing prompts that I will be giving to you. So you have to take good notes. This is going to be true now, and this will be true when you get to college. If you go to college and you think, well, I'll just sit there and uh, I'll just absorb all the information into my head, you got something else coming at you. It's it's not going to work. You're going to fail. I mean, you just you just will. No human being is good at taking in verbal information. And there's a lot of psychology to back up the claim that I just made. Human beings are very good at writing things down when they can actually see it um, and, and read it. They're much more likely to remember. So you need to be doing that. This is psychologically, scientifically speaking, the best way to take notes. So on that notebook that you have there in front of you, what you need to do is you need to make a Q uh, column. So whether it's two and a half inches, two inches, I don't care. It doesn't have to be exact, but you need to make a column on the left side of your page. That Q column uh, is going to have all of the headings. So for example, if I were to take notes on this particular slide, Taking notes would be in my Q column, and that would be the first thing. This area over here is the actual note-taking area. All of these notes here would be over here in the note-taking area. But I do want to caution you. A lot of students think, oh, there, there are words on the screen. I'm going to write down those words on my piece of paper. Now I'm good. I'm all set. Wrong. Absolutely wrong. You need to take notes, yes, on the, the, the slide here with the words on the screen, but those words on the screen are really for me. It's for me to look at and say to myself, oh yeah, that's right, I have to talk about that. It's for me to kind of jog my, jog my memory. So you need to be taking notes on what, or, or what is on the screen, but also what I say. 
you have to get in the habit of doing so. There are many college professors who don't put things on a screen. They go to the front of the classroom and they talk and you are expected to write down and organize all the notes purely based on what they are saying. So you have to get in the habit of doing both. Write down what's on here, but write down what I'm saying as well because I give a lot of extra information that you are going to need to know. If I put all of my information on the slide, there would, the whole slide would just be text. It would not be, not be any good, wouldn't be very entertaining. It would not be the most efficient way to learn. So your notes go right there. This last part is for you to do after class. So if you have me on A day, do it on B day. If you have me on B day, B day do it on A day. This summary section right down here, what you are to do with the, the summary section is you are to just summarize your notes on that page in a sentence or two. Psychology has shown that when human beings summarize or at least go over the main uh, main points, they're much more likely to remember them. So take out your notebook on the days that you do not have me and write a sentence or two. That's it. I don't need you to write five paragraphs on what you learned. Just write a sentence or two. What were the major topics? What were the major themes? And then move on to the next page. If you summarize each page of your notes on your off days, you're much more likely to remember that information and therefore much likely to do better on the exam. Let's go ahead and move on here to our quote of the day. So every day we'll have a quote of the day. And this, will, this quote of the day um, will... Uh, show some of the themes that we'll be talking about uh, during the lecture. So it says, a youth, when at home, should be filial and respectful to his elders. And that comes from Confucius, who we'll be talking about momentary, momentarily. The word filial is where we need to put our, put our focus. Filial means that you are respectful. It means you honor your mother and your father. If your mother and father tell you to do something, you go and do it and you don't argue you don't say well uh, here you know here's what i would rather have no your mother and father tells you to go do something you do it without question we're going to see that that idea is going to um permeate throughout chinese society and the government is going to use that in order to have a have, you know structure a society and we'll see examples of that a little bit later so if that isn't quite clicking in yet don't worry about it. We'll get to it in just a second here. This is arguably the most important slide for any of our lectures. If you don't understand what we are learning and why we are learning it and how we are going to prove that we learned it, then it's going to be difficult for you to learn. So I am going to break all of these things down. Do you need to write all of these things down? No, not really. Um, what you, you don't need to write down the essential questions every day because they're going to be the same exact questions every single day for the entire unit. Let's go ahead and look at all three of them. What factors contribute to the formation of expansion and decline of nations? How do nations form? How do they get bigger? And then what causes them to fall apart? Number two, what methods do governments use to centralize their power? What we're going to see in this unit is we're going to see some governments that are highly centralized, and we're going to see some governments that are highly decentralized. Centralized means that the power is all in one person or maybe a small group of people or maybe one government. For example, you aren't in class. I'm looking at the classroom right now. I wish you guys were here, but you aren't. But let's pretend that you guys did come into class and you guys were sitting in desks. I stand in front of the classroom and I demand that you do what I tell you to do. I am the teacher. I'm the one who has all the power. Well, that is a very centralized way to run the classroom. I'm the one who makes the, the, the decisions. You're the one who does that. A centralized government is a very powerful government. They have a lot of um, power and a lot of centralization. We're going to see how governments centralize their power. What methods do they use? On the other hand, let's go back to our classroom example. Imagine you came into my classroom. I stood, stood at the front and said, you know what, class? You guys just do whatever you want. OK, I'm just going to sit up here. If you have any questions, you can ask me. Um, here are some textbooks. You know, just read through it, do whatever you want. That's a very decentralized classroom where the power is not in my hand, the government's hand, but the power is in the hands of the people. It's not a very strong government.
And you can imagine some of the pros about having that type of society and some of the uh, cons about having that type of society. So we'll see examples of centralized government, especially in this lecture. And in later lectures, we'll look at decentralized governments and we'll be able to compare um, one to another. And number three, how does the development of culture create long-term impacts? What I'm going to do today is I'm going to give you one example of a cultural norm that has been in society for an incredibly long time and has an impact on our society today. And we'll see an example of that a little bit later when we talk about Confucianism. So that is what we are learning and that is why we are learning it. We need to be able to answer these questions. These are very difficult questions and it will take us the entire unit to get through them in order to adequately answer them, especially since we're looking at all of the regions in the world. The proof of understanding is I can develop a thesis statement. I know you wrote thesis statements in um, English last year. This is a writing class. You might think, oh, it's a history class. No, it's a writing class that happens to be about history. We're going to write in this class every single day. And hopefully your writing is going to improve. The, I, I am a big believer in writing every single day in, in order to become a better writer. That's what you have to do for the AP exam. And that's what you have to do to be good in college. In college, you are expected to write over and over and over and over and create good claims and have good examples and use uh, supporting evidence. All of those things you talked about in English class will apply to this class and maybe even uh, some other things will apply. This is actually very complex writing, but we're going to take it one step at a time and we're going to get you to that AP college level um, writing. Let's go ahead and go to our themes for the year. What you'll see is that these are our major themes. So we have the environment, cultural development, government, economic systems, social interaction, and then technology. And you can read through all these. We see that the environment is how humans impact the world around them and how the world around them impacts human beings. Um, the cultural development, religion, customs, tradition, language. How does that culture develop? And how does that culture impact societies in the long term? We need to do a good job at seeing the long term effects. We're talking hundreds and thousands of years uh, in, in terms of the uh, long term effects. Government. How is a society governed? But not only how is a society governed, but maybe why would a society choose to be governed in that way? What are the good things about a government? What are the bad things about a government? The economic system, how a society finances itself. So do they use tribute payments? Do they collect taxes? Um, do they use capitalism? Are they more communist society? We'll look at all those things throughout the year. Social interaction and organization, how a society interacts with itself and with others. So we, whenever we are talking about an upper class, a middle class, and a lower class, that is social interaction and organization. And the last one is technology. How do societies gain technology? How do they develop technology? How do they respond to new technology? And we'll see that throughout the year as well. What I want to caution you with is I don't want you to just identify these things. I want you to be able to identify them and explain why they are important. For example, later, um, this is just the example I'm thinking of right now. Um, in unit two, we're going to be looking at Latin sails. This is a, a different type of sail that was uh, used on ships. If you can identify that, I mean, okay, that's good, but if you can't do any more than that, you're not going to do well on the exam. If you can identify Latin sales and then explain why they are important, because they allow people to travel much more quickly and they don't have to uh, use the wind directly behind them, the wind can be blowing in any direction and they can still go forward, now you actually have a better understanding of it. So don't just look at identifying these things be able to explain why they are important. And I will make sure to do that in my lectures as well. Let's go ahead and start with Confucianism. So you should have your Cornell notes. You should have your notebook there in front of you. You should go ahead and write down Confucianism in the Q column. That is on the left side. These notes go on your right side, including all the things that I am going to say. And up here, I've put a little box so you can see it's purple and it says CDI. Well, the purple theme was cultural development. So this slide is going to be about religion, traditions, 
language, something having to do with culture and how it impacts society. Let's go ahead and look at Confucius. So here's Confucius right here. He was born in the 5th century BCE. So that's about 2,500 years ago. Now, Confucius is born during the warring periods or the period of the warring states in China. There's a lot of chaos happening. We're not going to talk about that too much because that's out of our time frame. But just know that there's a lot of chaos. There's a lot of war. That's why it's called the period of the warring states. So when Confucius is born um, and when he and when he's growing up in his very unique family situation, his father was 70 years old. His mother was 16 and both of them had died by the time he was a teenager. So both on a personal level and a societal level, Confucius's life was very chaotic. He wanted to bring order to that society. That is what um, gave him an incentive to start writing about how to bring order to society. How do you order a society so it is not so chaotic? That was really his goal. He believed that people had to read um, and educate themselves. You couldn't just um, go through nature. You couldn't just kind of just you know, float through life and do whatever you want, because that would lead to a very unorganized and chaotic life. It was necessary for a person to educate themselves, to read the classics, to learn as much as they can in order to become a better person and therefore have a better society. Now, Confucianism believes in a lot of these um, things right here. Um, there's the correctness in personal interactions, obeying one's society, this and that. Those things are, necess are, are, are necessary. We're not going to talk about all of those things because it's not a comparative religion class. What we will talk about is filial piety. And I'll talk about that on the next slide. So before I do, I want to jump down to this one. Now, we're not really going to talk about Wu Wei much, and you're really never going to write about it. But stu students often get tripped up on this. Wu Wei is eff effortlessness. So students see that and they think, so what? I can just be lazy. I can just kind of lean back in my chair, kind of just do whatever I want. I don't, I'm not putting in too much effort. I'm obeying Confucian principles. That's not it. Effortlessness is that you have worked so hard and become so good at something that it is effortless for you to do it. Best example, Steph Curry. Steph Curry, point guard for the Golden State Warriors, shooting guard, whatever. He's a guard for the Golden State Warriors. Um, anytime he gets the ball, he, he shoots it just like this. He's got an absolute beautiful shot. It's not like Steph Curry grabs the ball and thinks, you know what, let me get my elbow in the right place. Let me follow all the way through. Let me put three down and two up. Not, nothing like that. He's done that shot so many times that it's just effortless. He can do this over and over and over. You are going to be engaging in Wu Wei throughout the entire year. We are going to write in every single class period, and so you are going to get better at writing. You're going to put in a whole lot of effort, so eventually, hopefully by the end of the year, it will be effortless for you to write. Let's jump to filial piety. So remember, filial piety, one of those major beliefs of Confucianism. Filial piety is this idea that you must show respect for your elders. Look at this picture here. Little kid is... A I guess, massaging his, his mother, he's showing respect for her, and then the mother is uh, massaging the father figure here, or whatever it is that they, they happen to be doing. He is respecting her, she is respecting him. So you must show respect for your elders. The government is going to use this. We're going to see, especially the Song Dynasty that we'll talk about in a little bit, uses this to encourage people to respect the government or the bureaucracy. When I say bureaucracy, I mean all of the people who are involved in government. So if we look at our government in the United States today, senators and Congress people and the president and the president's cabinet and everyone who works in the government, that is the bureaucracy. That's what I that's what I mean by that. So how does the government use this? The government of China says, hey, you know how you respect your mother and your father? And the people of the Song Dynasty say, so yeah, we get that. That's a Confucian principle. The government says, you should respect us in the same way that you respect your mother and father. You do not question us. Whatever we say, you do. And the people are going to say, yeah, that, that makes sense. That's a Confucian principle. That's something I believe in. And so I'm just going to do whatever my government tells me to do. This is where we start to see um, culture have an impact over a very long period of time. 
Before I get into that, I do want to just mention that the idea of Confucianism is, yeah, doing what your government government tells you to do, but there's also this idea that you should stay in your social class. For example, in the United States, since we all know about the United States here, um, there's our stories are rags to riches stories. Someone is is very poor, comes from the lowest of the lows, and through hard work and determination, rises up through society and becomes one of the richest people in the United States. We love stories like that. I mean, there's so many movies that are rags to riches, poor people working very hard, becoming wealthy and successful in the end. But those stories don't really exist in Chinese society. Most of the stories in Chinese society are about how you do your job and you do it correctly. So if you are a janitor, your goal isn't to move up and become president of the United States. Your job is to be a really, really good janitor. And if you can be the best janitor that you are capable of becoming, then you have done a good job. You have lived a meaningful life. If that doesn't quite click in yet, we'll be looking at that idea a little bit later um, when we look at Southeast Asia, especially when we look at the Bhagavad Gita um, in our uh, lecture about Southeast Asia. What we're going to call that is role ethics, and we're going to call it Eastern ideology. And we'll see the differences between Eastern ideology and Western ideology uh, throughout the entirety of the year. Let's go ahead and I'm, I'm going to give you a couple examples of how culture impacts society in the long term and what we should be looking for in this class. And then I'll tell you a story about a woman's place in Confucian society. So if we compare the United States to China, I think we'll have a better understanding of how important culture is. In the United States, for reasons that we will get into much later throughout the year, the United States is very individualistic. We believe that the individual should be the one who works hard. Think about our stories. It's always just one person who works very hard. It's not one person relying on other people. It's one person through their own will and determination by themselves, pushing themselves to um, an upper class or to wealth and success. This person who is pushing themselves, they are, they're going to go against others. They might go against the uh, wishes of their mother and father. They may even go against the wishes of their government if it means that they are going to be successful. Best example, example that I can think of right now, Martin Luther King Jr. I mean, this is a man who opposed what the government was doing, who questioned what the government was doing and protested the government and now is considered a very su successful person. I mean, there are statues of Martin Luther King Jr. all over the place. We have a holiday for him. So obviously a very successful person and someone who we, we should admire. In China, there's this idea because of filial piety that you should not oppose your government. So if your government says, do this, you're just going to do it. Whether you believe it's correct or incorrect, you're going to do it because your government told you to do so and you're not going to question this. Now, this idea of filial piety, as we saw with Confucianism, goes all the way back 2,500 years ago. So let's fast forward to 2019. In the response to the COVID-19 crisis, you had the American response and you had the Chinese response. People, including members of the media, have been very quick to criticize the leadership of the United States and praise the leadership of China for the various responses to COVID-19. I would argue now I would argue that yes, the, the leadership of both those countries does play a role, but it's only you know the, the, there's only so many people in the leadership in the United States. There's only so many people in the leadership in Chinese society. A response to a COVID, the COVID-19 crisis requires an entire country to respond to this. We should be focusing on what the people are doing. So if we look at the United States, the United States is highly individualistic. And there's been cases in which the United States, people of the United States, have protested their government or have not done what the government tells them to do. And so we saw in the United States very individualistic responses. We saw people say, you know what? I'm not going to wear a mask. We saw people say, I'm going to go out to these restaurants. We saw people kind of take an into more individual response to COVID-19. On the other hand, in China, as soon as the government said, hey, you need to put on a mask, you need to stay inside, we need to contain the spread, 
people did so and never even bothered to question it because of filial piety dating back 2,500 years ago. So the reason that the Chinese response was at least more successful than the U.S. response does it has nothing to do with who the leadership of China, uh, who, who is in the leadership of China now, but it has everything to do with what happened 2,500 years ago. This is why we study history. We have a much better understanding of why things occur in our world today. If you want to learn more about your world, don't go on Twitter and read all the headlines. You won't learn that much. You'll never be able to put it in its appropriate context. Go backwards, look at history, and you'll have a better understanding of what's going on in our society today. Let's move on to women. We're going to be talking about women a lot. In fact, maybe even one of our tests might kind of be about women. That's a hint. Make sure you remember that there. So a woman's position in society. What we're going to do throughout this unit is we're going to compare how women are treated in various societies. So we'll see women are treated well, we'll see women are treated poorly, and then we'll see how that changes um, throughout our study of history as well. Now, women in Confucian society occupy a position below men. It, it is a Confucian quote that men are supposed to be fair and good, whatever the heck that means. Women are supposed to be understanding. So women aren't supposed to argue back with their husband. They're not supposed to argue back with their father. They're just supposed to understand what their father says or what their husband says, and then do that. Women are to be led and to follow others. To see this, let me tell you a story. So I just said that stories in American society help establish culture. Our rags to riches story establish our culture of wanting individual success. Well, stories in China are the same way. Those stories are going to establish culture. So one story from uh, some, some of the Confucian classics is about this man. So this man um, is married to, to a woman, and this man uh, takes another woman, uh, a, a concubine, if you will. Now, you would imagine here, being in American society, that the wife of that man would be very mad at the man, correct? Because it's the man who is taking the concubine. But that's not the way that works. The, the wife isn't mad at the man. She's mad at the concubine. She says, well, wait a second. This, this other woman over here, she's taking you away from me. You need to send her away because she's the one who's bad. Not you, you, my, my husband. She is the one who is bad. So that really does show you what a, what a woman's place in society was in Confucianism. It was supposed to be, you are just understanding and you are obedient to the man, to your husband. Well, this particular, uh, th this other woman, we'll call her the, the other woman, she actually had a son by the man that I was talking about. So once that woman is sent away, she has a, has, has a son and has to raise him on her own. Now, she's a woman. She's not going to be able to get any sort of job in Confucian society because women are seen as inferior. Men are the one who are supposed to worry. Women stay home, take care of the kids, and do whatever their husbands tell them to do. So this son of this, this other woman, we'll say, um, eventually works his way up through society, studies the Confucian classics, and becomes part of the government bureaucracy, thus earning a whole lot of money in order to support his mother, which is going to be another major theme in Chinese society that we'll look at in just a little bit. That major theme being, you want to be in the government bureaucracy if you want to be successful. That's going to cause the government bureaucracy to grow and therefore will cause the government to be more centralized. Let's look at Taoism. So these are a couple um, responses to Confucianism. I'll summarize Taoism very quickly. If Confucianism is studying all of the classics and reading as much as possible and, and working as hard as you can to make yourself better, Taoism is not doing any of that. Taoism says, well, look, when when whenever we try hard in society, we mess things up. I mean, think about your own life. Have you ever tried to do something with good intentions and then it just gets worse? Well, Taoists would say, yeah, stop trying so much. Look, be in nature. Nature is all around us. It was created by something that's not us. So let's just enjoy our nature and not mess with it. Don't mess it up. People who are 
more environmentalists would probably say something similar to that. They would say, well, look, this great society that we've created is horrible for nature, horrible for the environment. So we should just stop trying so hard. We should just let nature B. That's kind of what the Taoists think. They reject this idea of studying really hard and trying to create a better society. Just live. Just enjoy the world around you. The other big one is Buddhism. Now, now Buddhism is not going to come from China. It's actually going to come from Nepal and then move to China. And we'll talk about um, the movement of religions and the movement of culture um, throughout, actually throughout our entire study of history. Now, the founder is an individual named Siddhartha Gautama. I'm just going to call him the Buddha. Now, the Buddha is born as, as an incredibly wealthy individual. He's a prince. His father's incredibly wealthy. Um, his father traps him in the house for reasons that we're not going to get into because I do want to keep this video fairly short. But eventually, Prince Gautama, the, uh, who will eventually become the Buddha, goes outside of this house and he sees all of this pain. And all of this suffering that is happening, pain and suffering that he has never seen before because he's just lived in his big mansion for his entire life. And so he is overwhelmed by all of this pain and suffering. He sits underneath a Bodhi tree, a famous tree in China. Um, and he, what he says to himself is, I'm going to sit under this tree and I am going to meditate and I'm going to figure out the meaning of life, figure out why there's all of this suffering. And I'm not going to move until I figure all that out. So he does that. And eventually he reaches nirvana, which is a state of enlightenment with no desires and therefore no suffering. Well, what did he find out? He found out these four noble truths. He says, all this suffering, well, that's a horrible way to start a uh, religious philosophy there. Everything that ever happens is suffering and pain. Okay, not, not too bright, but he goes on. He says, attraction and aversion cause suffering. What he's saying is that when you are attracted to things, you suffer. What, think about it this way. If you really, really want a new pair of shoes, there's like the new brand new Jordans there and you can't get them because they cost too much money. You are suffering. You're like, I really, really want those, but I can't have them. And so there's pain inside me. He says that's what causes that suffering, that all of this attraction to all of these worldly goods just makes us suffer. So what we need to do is that in order to stop suffering, we need to stop being attracted to things. We need to stop saying, I want those Jordans and just say, you know what? I'm just going to enjoy my life. He says using the Eightfold Path um, is, is the best way to reduce attraction. Here's the Eightfold Path. Once again, we're not going to get into this because this isn't a religious studies class. If you have a, any interest in Buddhism, you have the Internet. So go ahead and, uh, and check it out there. But what I want you to see is that Confucianism stressed how an individual should live in society. Buddhism stretched stress how an individual should live more on an individual or like this spiritual basis so you have this very strict rigid organization and then you have this uh very like kind of looser more spiritual feeling if only you could combine those two things together you could probably have a a religion that addresses societal concerns while also addressing personal concerns that is neo-confucianism now is it important that is it important to know every aspect of neo-confucianism no what we need to realize is that this is an example of what we call syncretism syncretism is the blending of culture so in the, in the previous slide, I think I was actually using this hand here. We had Confucianism that had societal organization for government. We had Buddhism that had personal fulfillment. Now we combine them both together and we have a new religion. Syncretism is whenever you have a combination of things. It can be religions. It can be language. It can be customs. It can be culture. It can be literally anything. It can even be architecture. We'll see examples of that a, a little bit later. Syncretism is just the blending of cultures. What we're going to see is that many societies gain um, partake in what we call selective change. A society may change, but that doesn't mean that they're going to completely abandon everything. Um, after all, if I told you 
to to change the change the way you think, you would still retain some of your old ways of thinking. You would just add mine onto it. That's what's happening here. It's not Confucianism coming in and dominating Buddhism. It's them working together. It's them syncing up. It's selecting what changes you want to make while keeping the things that you like. And we're going to see cultures throughout the entirety of history take things that are new and add them to their, their society and keep things that they like. Let's go ahead and move on. We're done talking about culture, uh, at least for right now. We're going to go ahead and look at government. So that is why GOV and the red is right up here. We'll talk about the sway and the tongue very, very quickly um, because they are outside our period of history. Um, but then we're going to look, mainly look at the Song Dynasty. Before we do that, there's something I need to bring up, and that is the Conrad Damaris model. This is what we're going to do at the very end of our unit. I'm going to give you a sheet of paper. It's going to have all of its information about the Conrad Damaris model. So you need to make sure that you understand what I'm talking about, because I'm going to bring this up in every single lesson this unit. Let's get started here. What is the point of this? This model shows how an empire is built and how an empire maintains power and then how an empire collapses. I'm not really going to be looking at the collapsing too much, at least not yet. But we'll especially look at the other three, and they go hand in hand with our essential questions. Our essential questions were how do big governments form and how do societies or governments centralize their societies? Well, and the Conrad de Mars model shows that. First off, you need to have small states and they need to have high agricultural potential. So you're going to have a bunch of small groups of people. And they're all going to be different than one another. They're going to have their own little separate societies. But then you need a leader who unifies everyone and creates an ideology to support identifying with the state. So some leaders going to come in and say, hey, guys, hey, everyone come in here. Look, all of us have like the same religion. Maybe we have the same language. Maybe we have the same customs. Maybe we even just look similar to one another. We're, we have the same racial features. So we should all work together instead of working against one another. This, you can start to see how this is going to create a larger society. Once this larger society is created, people need to be happy. If people are mad, they're going to rebel. So the government must keep them happy. How do they keep them happy? Give people new stuff. Give people new technology. People love new technology. There are lines out the door every single time they release a new iPhone, even though it's so similar to the old iPhone and very similar to what Samsung did like three versions ago. So people love technology. Somehow give the people money. Everyone loves money. So if you can get them money, they're going to be happy. And give them goods. Make sure they have food. Make sure they have shelter. Make sure they have water. You give them all those things, they're going to be happy and they're going to love your government. Eventually, we'll see the collapse. Either a society gets too big physically and just there's too many people, there's too much going on, there's no way the government can control it, and so everything falls apart, or there's too many taxes that lead to people um, not being able to save enough money, and they are unable to purchase, especially like food, um, and that leads to a rebellion. We will see that, especially in Unit 5, when we talk about the French Revolution. So what I'm going to do throughout the entirety of this unit is I'm going to point out different parts of the Conrad de Maris model. So you'll need to make sure that you understand what points 1, 2, 3, and 4 all. This is the process of building an empire before it collapses. Let's look at the Sui dynasty. So Sui. There's North China up here. There's South China right down here. Those are two separate societies. So that's Conrad de Mars model part one. Two separate societies and the agricultural potential is high. What if we could combine those two societies together? Well, couldn't we trade more? Couldn't we work together? Wouldn't that be better for everyone? People start to agree with that. And so what happens is that the government says, we're going to build the Grand Canal. As you see right here, that is this blue line right here. The Grand Canal is a waterway that connects South China to North China. So all the goods in South China now can be used in North China. All of the goods in North China, well, now they can go down to South China. It unifies the country together based on trade. That's CD uh, part number two. 
is that you're unifying people together. Instead of having two separate societies, now they're one society. Here's what I want to point out because here's where students make a mistake. They think, okay, done. I'll write down Grand Canal. I'm done. I'll throw my pencil away. I don't have to take notes anymore. I got it down. Wrong. It's one thing to know the Grand Canal. It's a different thing to know why the Grand Canal is important. If you say, well, the Grand Canal is this canal in China, yeah, you're not going to get any points on the AP exam. If you say the Grand Canal is a canal in China and it connected North and South China together, allowing them to trade with one another and thus unifying China under the Sui dynasty, now you have a better understanding of the Grand Canal and now you'll be scoring points. In addition to this, the Grand Canal brings all of these goods that I talked about. And so people have more access to more goods. They're getting more wealth because they can trade. And therefore, they are happy. And therefore, that is Conrad de Merit's model part number three. Let's go ahead and move on to the Tang Dynasty. So as we see with the Tang Dynasty, there's a lot going on on this slide. We're going to talk about economic systems. We'll talk about society. We'll talk about government. And we'll talk about technology. The Tang Dynasty uses the Grand Canal as well in order to unify the people of China. The first thing they're going to do is have land reform. They're going to take land from the rich. Remember, land at this time is what creates wealth. If you have land, you have wealth. The more land you have, the wealthier you are. So land is taken away from the rich and given to the peasants. People like that. And since people like the government, the government's going to be powerful. Let's talk about an economic system here. And it's not so much an economic system, but it does have to do with economics. A tribute system. We are going to see this again in other societies like the Aztec. So we should be able to compare societies to one another. And when we get to the video on Latin America, I will mention that again. I will say you need to compare this to what was going on in China. Countries not controlled by China, so namely Japan and Korea, acknowledge China's superiority and uh, they give China goods and money and resources in exchange for trade and alliances. And so that way China doesn't beat them up. Think about the tribute system in this manner. Imagine that I'm the school bully. I'm pretty big. I'm six foot two. I'm a, I'm a big guy. I can kind of uh, use my height and use my size in order to bully people around. And um, I find uh, find uh, little Jimmy back there. Little Jimmy's just a real small guy. Now, little Jimmy's got lunch money every single day. He buys himself pizza on Wednesdays. He gets himself Takis from the uh, snack machine. I want that. So I can go up to little Jimmy and I can say, hey, Jimmy, give me all your money or I will beat you up. Jimmy is going give, to give me all his money because he does not want to be beaten up. That's what's going on in Japan and Korea. China goes up to Japan and Korea and says, look, we're way bigger than you are. We have way more people. We have better technology. If you don't give us what we want, we will come in and we'll destroy you. And Japan says, you know what? We'll give you what you want. We'll give you some resources, okay? Just, you know what? Let us trade with you. Let's build some alliances. Please just don't beat us up. We're going to see that big societies like that bully other little societies in order to get tribute payments, in order to get resources and good deals um, from those smaller societies. So we're going to see for an incredibly long time, Korea is going to be bullied by China. China is going to come to the Korea Peninsula and say, give us all your stuff. Otherwise, we will beat you up. And what choice does Korea have? They're so much smaller than China. Japan, on the other hand, is going to take things a little bit differently. Japan is going to engage in the Heian period um, in which they will emulate Chinese tradition. So if it's in China, it's going to be in Japan. China has a centralized government. Japan will have a centralized government. China, uh, China has a certain type of artwork. Japan will have that certain type of artwork. So we see that Japan makes some selective changes. Still, they're going to be Japanese. They're going to maintain parts of their Japanese culture, but they will use parts of a, another let's say, more dominant culture in order to improve their society. What we're going to see is that Japan will do that again. In Unit 6, we're going to see that Matthew Perry comes in uh, with his big ships, and Japan's going to say, ooh, we might be a little behind the Americans, huh? Uh, we're going to need to copy some of the things that they've done, but we'll talk about that more in Unit 6. 
Let's talk about agriculture productivity. This is an incredibly important aspect and it's often overlooked because the majority of us in this class are not farmers. I am certainly not a farmer. I'm not going to profess that, that I have any farming knowledge. Uh, so my knowledge is somewhat limited on the farming aspect of it, but I understand how it impacts society. So agricultural productivity, more food, it creates more food. When you have more food, you can have more people. If you have more people, you can have more power. But in addition to having more food and more people, more people can do things that aren't farming. For example, in the United States, we have a lot of food and food is fairly easy to get. You go down to the Circle K, you get yourself some food and you come back to class when you're actually in school here. Because you don't have to worry about hunting or farming your own food, you can go do literally anything else. You can invent things. You can learn about math. You can learn about science. You can learn about the world. You can write a book. You can have discussions on how best to organize our society. You can do all of those things because you don't have to actually worry about getting food. So you can start to live in a more urban area an area where you're not going to be able to grow food because you don't have to. The food is pretty much provided for you. In those urban areas is where society is going to progress. After all, it's not like you're going to go to the middle of Kansas or the middle of Oklahoma and you're going to see all these like great, wonderful, progressive ideas that are going to push society forward. That's just not going to happen because it's a rural farm area all of the progressive ideas are going to be in the major cities. That's where you get people talking to one another. That's where you get the Silicon Valleys of the world where people are inventing new things. So urbanization is incredibly important because it pushes society forward. There are pros and cons to urbanization. We'll talk about those later. But the only reason that urbanization, people living in cities can occur is because agriculture productivity has become better. So we see this process here. The use of manure, uh, while absolutely disgusting, um, is going to make crops grow a lot faster. So, hey, more food for the people. There's going to be irrigation system. Heavy plows it is going to be easier to plow the land and harvest the crops. And chomper rice. Don't sleep on chomper rice. It's actually incredibly important. I know it seems very odd that I'm going to spend time talking about the importance and wonders of rice, but it is important. In Southeast Asia, that we'll talk about later, there was champa rice. For our purposes, we need to know that champa rice is a more efficient rice. You can grow more of it, and it grows much more quickly. Via trade, China got champa rice. And because they got champa rice, now they had more rice, because champa rice is more efficient than regular rice. And because they had more rice, now they could feed more people. Because they had more people who had a ease of access to food, those people could start to live in urban areas, and then those people could look at uh, start to create all the great technology that we're going to talk about in just a little bit here. So we see that centralization and urbanization are incredibly important, and that will be a topic that we will be talking about later as well. Last one, the Song Dynasty. The Song Dynasty is going to use a civil service exam. Let me back up just a little bit. The Song Dynasty comes in in 960 and it's going to be around to 1279. Um, the Mongols are going to come in and take over. Sorry to spoil it there, but we'll talk about the Mongols a, little, a bit more in Unit 2. The Song Dynasty needs to centralize their power. There's a lot of chaos after the Tang Dynasty collapsed, and so the Song Dynasty needs to be strong. The best way for a government to be strong, add more people to the government. If you add more people to the government bureaucracy, well, then more people equals more power, right? So you'll have a more centralized society in which you can control people and in which you can actually run the society. So that way, you know, things are actually happening and um, things are being produced and trade is occurring. So how do we grow this government bureaucracy? How do we make it bigger? I mean, we could just add random people, but what if those random people aren't good? What if those random people are lazy? What if they're not intelligent? There has to be some sort of way to bring the best and the brightest of Chinese society into the government bureaucracy so the government can be stronger and therefore control society and make sure society is good. Well, what the Song Dynasty does is they issue the civil service exam. This is 
Ooh, oh yeah, I spelled it right. Test. Test based on Confucian text. So we see that Confucianism still plays a huge role thousands of years of years later in the Song Dynasty. Now, if you're a person in um, the Song Dynasty, what you're going to do, and this is only open for males, but it is open to all males, is you are going to study the Confucian text as much as you possibly can. You're going to learn them like the back of your hand, and then you're going to take a test. And if you pass that test, you will be a part of the government bureaucracy. This is a meritocracy. You are promoted based on your merit, based on what you are capable of doing, not based on who your daddy is. Just because your daddy was a politician and he was in the government bureaucracy means that you're in the government bureaucracy. No, that's not a way that China is going to run their society. They're going to use a meritocracy. More people equals more power for the government. The government is going to centralize their power. And we're going to talk about the great, wonderful things about centralization all throughout this unit. But then when we get to units four and five, we'll see that centralization has its cons. It has its weaknesses as well. Um, and sometimes decentralization is actually the better way to go. Um, but we'll see that much later in our study. Now, because of this government centralization, because the government is controlling almost all of the aspects of society, they are keeping people efficient. After all, think about the think. About, let's go back to the classroom example here. If if we are running a centralized classroom where I am the one in charge and I'm the one who says this is what we are learning today and all of us are working. Oh, we're going to get so much stuff done. We are going to get so many things done. We are going to be so efficient. We're going to be such a great class. But if we have a decentralized classroom where I say, hey, you know, you guys just kind of do whatever you want. I'll stay up here and I don't want to impose on you on you too much. Well, we're not going to get much done. I mean, there's going to be kids sitting around on their phones, texting and listening to music and just generally screwing around instead of actually doing what they're supposed to be doing. So what we're going to see is that within this centralized society, the government is going to make everything so efficient. And that's why so much of this technology that I will talk about on the next slide is going to come out of China instead of coming out of, say, Europe. But we'll talk about that in our um, next lessons as well. We see that under the Song Dynasty, because of all the agricultural productivity, there's more and more urbanization. So more people living in those cities, instead of farming, can create porcelain and tea and silk that they can sell to other nations and therefore make a whole lot of money. They can import cotton, stones, fruit, horses. Um, they can make paper money because there's an urbanized area. It's much easier to make that paper money. They'll use woodblock printing. It will bring a whole lot of wealth. So because of this government centralization, more and more wealth is coming into the society. That is Conrad DeMar's model part number three. I mean, that's it. I have a centralized society, have people identify with the government and keep people happy via trade. The Song Dynasty took what was broken up after the Tong Dynasty, CD model part number one. They made people identify with the state using Confucian texts. That's CD model part number two. Then they brought trade and wealth to the people in order to keep them happy. That's CD model part number three. So we're seeing parts of the Conrad Damaris model, and we're going to have to keep, keep our eye out for them, not only in our study of East Asia, but in our studies of all of the subsequent regions that we'll be looking at, such as Islam and the Americas and West and uh, East Africa. This is our last slide here. I wanted to put all this on the same slide. Because of this centralization and because of the urbanization that occurs because of the agricultural productivity, more technological advancements can be made. So once again, I want to caution you. I don't want you to think, okay, well, China created the magnetic compass. Cool. I want you to see China create, created the magnetic compass because they had a centralized society that made things more efficient and poured money into technological innovations. And because they had the agricultural productivity that allowed people to move into more urban areas instead of staying in rural areas. If you can say that second part there, if you can get all of that, then you actually know what's going on. And if you can put that on a piece of paper, you're going to score very high on that AP exam there. So make sure you understand why this technology exists in China and why it doesn't exist in Europe, at least not yet.
Let's talk about the technology. Gunpowder, metal, guns, all of this is going to be coming out of China. They're the first, the Song Dynasty is the first one to make guns. And what we're going to see in Unit 2 and then eventually in Unit 3 is that that technology of gunpowder and guns gets spread all throughout Eurasia, which is Europe and Asia, and societies are going to use guns. And that's going to have a profound impact on the world, but we'll talk about that more in Unit 3. Maritime technology, magnetic compass, rudder chinese uh, junk which is this ship right here so a magnetic compass that allows you to know which direction you are going when you're on the high seas a rudder allows you to actually change direction of your boat the chinese junk is a very efficient way um, to travel on the seas all of this maritime technology exists in china and what we'll see in unit two is via trade it's going to spread all throughout afro eurasia which is africa europe and asia um, and because of that, especially Europeans are going to take that maritime technology. And what we'll see in Unit 4 is that that maritime technology is going to lead them to cross the Atlantic Ocean and have Columbus discover America. Paper and woodblock printing. So instead of writing books by hand, now you actually have a printing press and where you can just press the, uh, the ink onto the paper. And now you actually have an entire book that is going to eventually spread to Europe and will cause this um, revolution in knowledge. There will be the Renaissance, there will be the Reformation, there will be the scientific revolution, and that gets to Europe, not because Europeans are so much smarter and more intelligent, but because Europeans traded with China, who already had this woodblock printing, because they had a more centralized and urban, side, urban society because of their centralized government and agricultural productivity. Um, and the last one is silk and porcelain, Right here, there's going to be silk and porcelain production and Europeans and others are going to demand silk and porcelain because those are luxury goods and people have always demanded luxury goods. The last part I will say here, because this has to do with Conrad Damaris model number three and number four, the taxes. What we're going to see in all these societies is that the governments have to have money and the only way they're going to have money is if they tax their citizens. Now, taxing the citizens can provide good things for the people. After all, think about our society today. We pay taxes, and therefore, we have this really nice school. I have this, uh, well, this is actually my computer, but I have a school-issued computer right here. Um, so we have all of these wonderful things because of taxes. But as we see in Conrad Damaris model number four, overtaxation takes money away from the people. And when you take money away from the people, it's much more difficult for them to eat. It's much more difficult for them to get the resources that they need. So because it gets difficult and because people have a will to survive, they're going to rebel in order to change the system. Now, we're not going to see that in this unit, but in later units, namely unit five, uh, especially with the French Revolution, we will see what happens when a society becomes overtaxed. Ladies and gentlemen, that's going to wrap up our lecture on uh, Chinese society. What I need you to know is I need you to look back at the essential questions. Look at how a go government's form. Look at how governments centralize their power. What methods do they use? They use tribute payments. They use taxes. They use, um, sometimes they use religion or some sort of commonality with the people in order to centralize their power. We, but we also need to look at the long-term impacts of culture. You need to be able to understand how Confucianism, which was 2,500 years ago, still has an impact on our society today. You also need to understand all four parts of the Conrad Damaris model. I'm going to be bringing up all of those themes again and again and again throughout this unit. If you don't understand them now, it's going to be much more difficult for you to understand them later. If you do have questions, please make sure you email me or somehow send me a message and I will gladly respond back to you and help you guys out. In our next lecture, we're going to be going over the uh, world of Dar al-Islam.